I want to thank those who were preaching for me over the last few weeks. I've been uh, out for a while, and I'm so thankful uh, for Pastor Landon to come in, and for Pastor Darren, and for Pastor Jeffrey to come, and just good godly guys that come and open God's Word and deliver the Word, and, and I'm so thankful uh, for them and, and uh, uh, their preaching. And, and, but it is, it is good to be back. I've got a, a little table now to use. Determined on vacation, I'm going to go back to this and maybe someday get a little pulpit because I'm old, too old to be walking around without a pulpit. You know, people think, trying to look like I'm young, I'm just embracing the fact that I get lightheaded as I get older, I can lean on something now. <laughs> Isn't that what's happening next? That's going to probably happen next. Um, we're in First Peter chapter 2. We're going to pick up where we left off, so we're in verse 18. Uh, and let me give you a recap while you're turning there. Because in First Peter, you've got these people who are suffering. And Peter writes them a letter and says, you've got living hope. Even though they're suffering, Peter says, well, your Savior is alive, so your hope is alive. As you keep reading into chapter 2 then, he says that you are a living stone. Even the rocks will cry out. Christ can make anything alive, and by His grace, He's made you alive even though you are who you are. And now you're a living stone. You're a, you're a representative of Christ Jesus. But the primary issue still for the people is their suffering. And so now as we get to the end of chapter 2 and throughout the rest of the letter, Peter is going to deal with the suffering, but from the platform of you have a living hope and you are a living stone. So yes, there's present suffering, but there is future glory. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 18. Let's stand, okay? We'll honor the reading of God's Word. It's good to see you in here today, and it's good to have those who are watching online. And uh, I am uh, thankful as we continue to slowly open these things back up. I know we still don't have the children's ministry, and we're still not doing the choir. It's maybe it's a little slower than, than some might like, but I'm thankful for your patience as we continue to do uh, what, uh, what we think is, is best as we move to this uh, position of kind of getting back to whatever normal is. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says this. Look at this first verse. Servants, your Bible might say slaves. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Not only to those who are good and gentle, but also those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Verse 20, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. You've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now, you've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Let's pray. God, thank you for this truth, and thank you for the opportunity we had to look at and learn from your word. I pray that we would, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be, speak, please be seated. You know, Peter wrote to an audience that was largely involved in servanthood. Some even speculate that 60% of Christians were servants in some capacity. Now, they had some things that they knew they could count on. If they had a debt, sometimes they would work as a servant to pay off the debt, and they would get a guaranteed place to stay, and they'd get guaranteed food. Other times, they just needed guaranteed place to stay and guaranteed food, and so they worked as servants. Some were treated very well. Many were not treated well, and some were 
physically abused. So as we look at what we read here, you might say, why didn't Peter speak against the practice? Why didn't Peter call for a revolution? What does the Bible say about slavery? Is, this, is that what this was? There are three things I want to show you from the text to show you how Peter deals with these issues. Here's the first thing I want you to see. Submission is a platform for the gospel. Look at verse 18. Submission is a platform for the gospel. That 18th verse just jumps off the page. Submission to bad masters? Isn't Peter going to speak out against that? What does the Bible say? Does Christianity endorse slavery? Well, let me show you what the Bible says says and how the Bible deals with slavery. A couple things I want you to notice. And the first is we, we've got to be humble enough to admit past mistakes. There has been great misunderstanding and the Bible has been misused in regards to slavery. The church and Christianity has been sinfully silent at times. The church and Christianity has been sinfully active in mangling the scriptures. There have been times, friends, where the church has said, the Bible says slavery is right. And because there weren't enough serious students of the Bible, that then penetrated many denominations, even the Baptist denomination. God forgive us. We also need to know this about the Bible as it relates to slavery. It is descriptive, but not prescriptive. The Bible describes the action of slavery, but it does not prescribe it as something you should do. The Bible describes the sinfulness of man, but does not prescribe it as something you should do. But by describing the sinfulness of man, the Bible points us forward to the need for a Savior because of the depravity of humanity. Let me give you an example. Abraham and Sarah wanted to have a baby. Wait for God. Be patient on God. God said he would take care of it. God will take care of it. But Sarah doesn't want to wait on God isn't going to wait on God and takes her slave and gives her slave to her husband so they'll have a baby. That's terrible in a lot of ways. That's slavery and then trafficking. The Bible's not for that. The Bible describes it, but if you read that story, what happened with Hagar and Sarah and Abraham, it did not work out well because it shouldn't. The Bible describes but doesn't prescribe that. Something else we see in the Bible, the Bible more closely links slavery to indentured servanthood. While that, why this matters is typically, specifically in the New Testament, and especially in the New Testament, this is a financial issue, not a racial issue. It's a financial issue. You're in debt or you need food and a place to stay. It's not to say that the mistreatment was right, but it's more closely linked to indentured servanthood than what we think of when we think of slavery. And, and this needs to be pointed out. Stealing and selling people is spoken out against in the Bible. The Bible clearly says stealing and selling people is wrong. Now that's more accustomed to what we think about with the uh, trans-American slave trade and the Arab slave trades and the European slave trades, the stealing of people and the selling of people. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, that enslavers like this are caught up in a group of people in a series of detestable sins before God, considered disobedient, ungodly, unholy, profane, and contrary to sound doctrine. In the Old Testament, Exodus 21, 16 and Deuteronomy 24, 7 says those caught stealing a man and selling a man are to be put to death to purge evil from among you. 
The Bible clearly speaks against slavery, the stealing of a man and the selling of a man. And a serious student of the Bible needs to be able to articulate that. You say, okay, well, still, but does Peter do enough? Shouldn't Peter have called for social revolution? Shouldn't Peter have called for political revolution? A couple things to notice about that. What Peter did do is radical. See, slaves and servants were considered unworthy of moral instruction. You know why? Because if you let them know that somebody cares about them, and if you let them know that they matter, they might rise up and demand more things and completely throw off the system. Servant labor made the economy go. And if you take away that and say, hey, you're valuable, if you say that God loves you, you're equal at the cross, well, that's a problem. The Romans don't want that. Owners don't want that. And so the fact that Peter mentions servants for Christian living is radical. Why would you say to a servant that he has equality in Christ? We don't want them believing that. Why would you tell a servant how to be a Christian? So what Peter does by mentioning it, that is revolutionary. But notice this, he's not doing it for social revolution. He's not doing it for political revolution. Let me, let me make sure I'm real clear on this. The primary function of the Christian church is not social revolution. If you want to be involved in social issues, great. Great. The church is involved in social issues, great. It's not the primary function of the church. The greatest thing the church wants is not social revolution. Listen to this. Primary function of the church is not political revolution. That may seem shocking, but the primary function of the church is not political revolution. If you want to be involved in politics, great. It's awesome. You should be great. Go vote. It's great. But it's not the primary function of the church. And you know why we know that? It wasn't the primary ministry function of Christ. His primary ministry function was not social revolution. His primary ministry function was not political revolution. His primary ministry function was spiritual revolution. What Christ wanted to see was spiritual change. What Peter wants to see is spiritual change. If there's heart change, there will be social change. If there's heart change, there won't be the need for some political revolution. Jesus purposely and intentionally moved away from those things because his interest was a platform to share the gospel. Amen. And verse 20 reminds us very clearly, there is no credit in sinning and suffering well. You can't say, I don't like my master, so I want to kill my master. And then I'll suffer for it, but then I'll do it nobly. No, you won't. You're a sinner. You killed a man. I don't like the slave system. I'm going to burn it all down. I'm going to burn all the houses down of all the masters, and I'll be noble in my endeavors. No, you won't. You're a sinner. You don't have moral high ground. You don't have platform for the gospel if you sin in order to say you get it. What Jesus says is just the, what Peter says here is just the opposite. What you need to focus on is if you suffer for doing right, now you have a platform to share the gospel. Because you're saying that Jesus gives grace and he gives mercy and he gives hope and he makes us living. And if you're actually living by the standards of society and you suffer for doing right, now your words can ring true when you talk about a savior of grace. So when it says submit here, what's it, what, why? There are different words for submission, different meanings sometimes go along with it. When he says be submissive to your masters, what's he saying there? He's saying being willfully obedient. Willfully obedient. You want to know another time that that word is used? In Luke chapter 2, the Lord Jesus is a young man, and he's at the temple. Mary and Joseph don't know where he is. They come find him. We, we didn't know where you were. And Jesus says, didn't you know? I'd be in my father's house. 
But then the Bible goes on to say in Luke chapter 2, Jesus willingly subjected himself to Mary and Joseph and grew in wisdom and stature and grace. There's no credit for sinning and claim, claiming moral high ground. Jesus wasn't trying to lead this children revolution over their parents. He was willingly obedient to the parenting of Mary and Joseph. And the Bible says he then grew in wisdom and stature and grace. He had the platform from which to launch his gospel ministry. The world today tells you something completely different. The world today tells you that when you suffer, it's okay to lose control. The world today tells you it's okay to hate people rather than suffer. And we see it on both sides of every debate. It's noble to hate people because they're so wrong. If you are a Christian and you desire a platform from which to share the gospel, it does not do you any good to stand up talking about how much you hate people. Because God so loved the world of people that he sent Christ. You want a platform to share the gospel? Do right and endure. Be willingly obedient and endure the consequences. If you want to grow in wisdom and stature and grace and your words to matter. Here's the second thing we see in the text. Now let's stay in verses 18 and now kind of focus deeper into 19 and 20. Suffering is the practice of the gospel. Submission is the platform for the gospel. Suffering is the practice of the gospel. Verses 18 through 20, well, how do I control myself? Because Peter says there are bad masters. There are those who are unreasonable. They inflict unjust suffering. They're dishonest. They're unrighteous. They physically abuse their servants. So what do you do? How am I supposed to practice Christian living in this environment? How am I supposed to model Christian living when this is going on? Verse 19, it finds favor. For the sake of conscious toward God to bear up under sorrows. What does that mean? That means when we focus on God's grace, we gain strength to endure suffering. You find favor. That word there, favor, is the word we have for grace, charis. It's the word grace. You find grace. Willingly obedient, focusing on God, finding the grace that God can give to help you endure during the suffering. That is what he wants. Focus on God. Receive his grace. Endure the suffering. This is the practice of gospel living. You say, I don't, that does not make a lot of sense to me. It would have made an awful lot of sense to Peter. When I was on vacation, I watched, I've watched this several times. We're actually going through it as a staff. It's a video on Netflix called American Gospel. I highly recommend it. In that, one of the pastors mentions a story, a unique story in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. Because it's a unique story because of where it's fit in the Bible, you don't really notice it as much. It's right before the Garden of Gethsemane. It's right before the Lord Jesus goes to pray, right before they come and take him away, right before the kangaroo court convicts him and sentences him to death, and right before he is beaten and crucified, right before that happens, there's a conversation Jesus has with Peter. It's a fascinating conversation. Luke 22, verse 31, 32. Here's what Jesus says to Peter. Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Think about that. Satan has demanded permission, like he got permission to go after Job. God gave permission for that. Now Satan is demanding that same permission to go after Peter and sift him like wheat. What would you do if Jesus came to you and said, Satan wants you and he's demanding permission to have his way with you? What do you think verse 32 would say? Did you tell him no? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Seems like a pretty simple fix, Lord. He wants no. Do you know what Jesus said? 
because this may seem pretty radical to you so far. You want me to be willfully obedient in a bad system? You mean that my submission and my suffering is what Christ wants? Peter, Satan is demanding permission to sift you like wheat. And then Jesus says, and I'm going to pray for you that your faith holds firm. Now, by the way, we're not talking about cartoon Satan. This isn't cartoon Satan. And if you listen to people, they create lots of cartoon Satans, right? This is the actual Satan. He can only be in one place at one time. He's not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at one time. And he demands the opportunity to be where Peter is so he can tear him up. The cartoon Satan that many of us have heard and maybe we have actually said before is this sort of foolish little this foolish little idea that Satan is everywhere at the same time. Like example, I got up today and I tried to go to work. My car wouldn't start. And I said, Satan, get out of my car. Satan can only be in one place at one time. And you think maybe that if you couldn't start your cars because Satan got in your carburetor that day, if Satan had permission to get into your car and your carburetor, he'd blow it up with you in it. <laughs> We, we act like this little car. Satan, get out of here, Satan. You get, Satan, you get. Get out of there, Satan. Don't steal my joy, Satan. Don't steal my hope. Don't steal my, don't steal my happiness. Don't steal. Satan, stop, Satan, stop. Seriously. How much faith does it take to beat cartoon Satan? Almost none. The real Satan, who can only be at one place at one time, wants to be where Peter is. And Jesus says, I'm going to pray that your faith holds up. Now, the demonic realm in a fallen world means that certainly there are plenty of pressures on you. You don't need to create a cartoon Satan to deal with a difficult life. But you do need to firm up your faith to deal with a difficult life. Because suffering is the practice of the gospel. I say, look, and let, me, let me prove it more. Here's how we know, because we have the benefit of history. Peter is writing at a specific time to a specific group dealing with a specific issue. We have history. What happened with this servant structure? What happened to it? The early church came in, and people were brought to faith in Christ. And there were Christians who were masters. And there were Christians who were servants. And because the gospel of Christ remarkably elevates the servants to say, hey, master, the servant is your brother. As the early church formed, we see in the Bible that as the early church formed and we see throughout the Bible that the slaves are elevated in this position and taught in this position, we see that as they came together, they were told, greet one another with a holy kiss. And suddenly a respect level is created. And in these situations, the servants recognize the brotherhood of the master. The master recognizes the brotherhood of the servant. And they all get it that we are one in Christ. So then when Paul says in Galatians 3.28, something that rings so true but would have seemed so counterculture, because of Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God. The gospel is the answer. It changed hearts. It changed minds. And the seeds of Christianity sown into this fallen system. And people see that we are one in Christ. Suffering is the practice of the gospel. The final thing we see is that sacrifice is the calling of the gospel. Look with me in verse 21. Jesus says, this is your calling. This is your calling, Peter writes. This is your calling. Christ is your example. Our suffering has value because of his sacrifice. Our calling is to see the sacrifice of Christ as our example. 
In verse 22 and verse 23, it, it's, it's copying now Isaiah 53. Christ was sinless in the persecution. He remained sinless. In verse 24, Christ in his sacrifice was our substitute. We deserved the wrath of God. We got the grace of Christ. We deserve the punishment. Christ took it in our place. And it says, by his wounds, you were healed. A servant would know something about being beaten. A servant would know something about being wounded. And while Christ was the model, a, certain would also, a servant would also certainly understand that they could not identify with his beatings and his wounds, because they actually heal people. The sinless one took a beating as a substitute for sinful people. Certainly we can't identify with his beating, with his wounds, but we benefit from his sacrifice. We complain about so many foolish things and we elevate problems just so that we can have problems that we feel justified complaining about. And yet we benefit from his sacrifice. Our pitiful excuses of slipping into sin in all our exaggerated fits of self-proclaimed justified anger that everybody's out to get me. Everyone's out to get me. My life said, Satan, Satan made me do it. No, he didn't. You did it. You just want someone to blame. So you create comic Satan. So he can be the problem that you're dealing with. The Bible says that as you practice things that give birth to sin. You generate the things. They come in you and you give birth to that sin. But you blame comic Satan. Our complaints are comical. Our excuses are exhausting. And yet, we benefit from his sacrifice. 34% of so-called Christians who aren't coming back to church yet, 34% of these so-called Christians now decided they don't even need to watch online anymore. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's such a struggle to watch on the internet. Comical. Our excuses are exhausting. Verse 25, though, look at this. First, verse 25, the straying sheep. Stop there for a second. This is what we are. Sheep, by the way, are not necessarily seen in the Bible as being real smart and making real good decisions, right? Here's our comparison. The strange sheep stumbling around, confused, lost, doesn't know where he's supposed to be. Benefits from his sacrifice. The, stay, the straying sheep has returned to the one who guards his soul. Praise be to God. As confused as we are, as exhausting as we must be with our excuses. The guardian of our soul. If you, because of grace alone, through faith alone, receive Christ alone as your Savior, the Bible says he becomes the guardian of your soul and nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. As pitiful as we, we don't want to suffer someone else's fault. We don't want to suffer. We need political revolution. We need social revolution. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. And then when you come to faith in Christ, you and me, a simple little sheep, have a guardian of our soul. Sacrifice is the calling of the gospel. Would you stand with me and let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to you today and to 
Read your word and trust it. God, we, we recognize, because we need to be honest, that what we see in here seems very counterculture and counterintuitive for us. Because we don't want to suffer. Help us see that being willingly obedient provides a platform to share the gospel. Living as a Christian and the practice of living the gospel leads to change. And the example to follow, the calling we have, has been perfectly lived out in Christ. And we are not perfect. We are not Christ. We are the sheep. And even as the sheep, the guardian of our souls offers us salvation. Help us firm up our faith. God, if there are those who are here and don't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray today that is made different. That they simply call out to you and ask you to forgive them of their sins, change their lives, save their lives, make them new. That they would follow you. We'll give the opportunity at the end of the service for those who want to talk to a pastor about that. For those who are online, they can right now be in touch with people online, say that they want to talk to somebody, they want to know more about a relationship with Christ. Focusing on you, God, we can deal with the suffering as we look to you for encouragement and you give us grace to deal with the suffering. And all of the things that we want, let us not forget about you, what we need. God, we love you. We thank you that you love us. We pray to you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.